So um, I'd like to thank you, thank uh, Smitty, uh, Sherry Sfexis, uh, I'm really hoping I said that said your name correctly, and Time Sisters in general for uh, inviting me to uh, talk about my research so far um, on colonial plantations, French colonial plantations in Saint-Domingue, um, primarily pre-revolutionary plantations. <clears throat> um, so let's see here. I'd like to welcome with that. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to, to Colonial Saint Domingue. Um, I have to give you a bit of a, a, um, I, I did that go back to the, my goodness. I am so sorry. <laughs> Good Lord. I have to give you a bit of a disclaimer um, as far as my research so far. Um, because we find ourselves in a COVID landscape, <laughs> a current COVID landscape, and because of the um, political uh, unrest that's going on in Haiti at the moment, uh, uh, my research at the moment is really lopsided. Uh, it's more uh, historical documentations and theory and colonial maps rather than the actual archaeology. And um, for me and for my, my research goals, the archaeology is, is right? Um, that's where we're going to find the enslaved narrative. So um, to give you some background, uh, Saint-Domingue, uh, present-day Haiti, is located in the Greater Antilles. Uh, before it came, became the pearl of the French metropole, the eastern portion of the island was, quote-unquote, discovered by Christopher Columbus in 1492 and developed into a profitable colony for Spain. Um, after several years of failed attempts to cultivate that, the western portion of Hispaniola, the Spanish was, uh, used this area to maintain cattle and horses. So towards the beginning of the French occupation of Saint-Domingue, the island was a popular refuge for what a friend and colleague calls, quote unquote, nautical misbehaviors, um, AKA pirates, buccaneers, et cetera, people who sought refuge from the excesses of Tortuga, which is located not far away, um, or sought to make some sort of, uh, mix, sought to make money off of, the horse, horses and cattle left by the Spanish to go feral on the on the western portion of this island. Uh, by the seven, uh, by the mid 17th century, France began to suddenly increase their presence and influence over the western portion of the island, uh, cultivating communities and trade. It wasn't until the Treaty of Ryswick of 1697 that Spain officially ceded control over the portion the portion of this island to France. Uh, and divide, thusly dividing it into French Saint-Domingue to the west and Spanish Santo Domingo to the east. Um, France's political or economic and political influence, uh, which really began with the Buccaneers uh, 40 years prior, gradually moved south to claim the rest of the western portion of the island, forming the historically recognized colony of Saint-Domingue, which was one of the last colonies to be established in the Caribbean. Uh, it only occupied one third of the island and eventually developed into, uh, you know, a powerhouse in, in the Antilles. So when we think about 18th century Domingue, uh, we need to talk about the demographics there. Uh, the society of Saint Domingue consisted of four distinct groups and each harbored their own concerns and agendas that helped uh, inflame discontent within the colony. The first tier of society uh, were the white planters who comprised only 10% of the population while owning the majority of the land within the colony. Uh, this class was typically united along racial lines. However, there were distinctions made within this, this class based on wealth and occupation. So we have a schism of sorts. We have the Grand Blancs, uh, the landowners who rarely lived in the colony and, or sometimes divided their time between the colony and France. And then we have the Petit Blancs, uh, who were the poorer whites, often the managers of the plantation estates, clerks, seamen, men and women in trade, and indentured servants. The, um, the next uh, class would be the Jean de Coeur, uh, represented, which would kind of represent the middle class. Um, it had a membership that was slightly ambiguous. So here the membership ranged from, you know, formerly enslaved 
individuals to French Creole landowners um, who were typically people with biracial or rather um, Afro-European ancest ancestry. This population was common in all plantation societies. However, the free people of color of Saint-Domingue were remarkable for its size and the cumul cumulative wealth uh, that this class owned by the, by the time the colony had reached its peak. <clears throat> Where there were for, roughly 40,000 whites in the colony at, the, at, the, at its peak, there were approximately 30,000 Jean de Couleur. And then the final class, obviously, we're talking about uh, the enslaved laborers who represented the majority of the population. Uh, similar to the free people of color, the enslaved population grew to impressive numbers during the 1780s. Uh, and while colonial documentation is not completely reliable, um, the general consensus is that there were approximately half a million enslaved individuals present. And of that half million, it's estimated that two thirds of the population were African born. So <clears throat> this really kind of presents a unique snapshot into what's going on, in the types of interactions that are taking place in this landscape. It's a frontier for sure, absolutely. I mean, you have all of the, these different cultures, uh, different languages, different, um, practices, cultural practices uh, that are coming together in such an incredibly small area. So because of this, uh, when I first started reaching saint um, the first book I read was Making of Haiti from Below by Carolyn Fick. Um, and this passage from our introduction really, really struck me. And it's, end quote, but on the whole, slave insurrections and popular movements during the revolution are treated either as isolated eruptions of little consequence to slavery and the plantation system, or as unwilling embroilments of the slaves in the conflicts of one or another political interest group. Rarely, if ever, are the insurrectionary movements of the slaves inspired by genuinely autonomous motives or their own initiative. So this is actually, really important um, because there's no denying that the French Revolution had, uh, which occurred in 1789, had considerable, considerable impact on, you know, Fr France's colonies in the Caribbean. And however, I think we need to kind of reassess the emphasis that's placed on the French Revolution as paving the way for the Haitian Revolution. It's, it's almost a disservice to the enslaved population um, in this colony, it is my general view. <clears throat> because as we know, during the French Revolution began in 1789 and the Haitian Revolution began in 1791. So we have that time gap where chaos is, is definitely happening, but there are, multiple documented um, occurrences of uh, small kind of methods of resistance, petit merunage, uh, grand merunage, um, uh, and uh, failed attempts throughout the Antilles, right? Where um, prior to the French Revolution where enslaved individuals were trying to overthrow the enslavers. So this kind of got me to, thinking about this level of enslaved involvement, this, I don't want to say subaltern, but, you know, almost more, not as a parent, rather, um, involvement in the development of, of the Haitian Revolution and how they were able to move and navigate their spaces in a way that might not have always been visible to the enslavers, to the planters, to the bourgeoisie, right? So why is understanding enslaved movement important? Because I think it can lead to uh, showing how and why the revolution was successful. Again, the enslaved were able to manipulate their environments just as effectively as Euro-Americans were. And the answers are in the archeology. span Oh boy, let's see here. 
I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> I don't know why this isn't working. Um, so for me, the devil's in the details, right? When we understand the way enslaved individuals moved or walked through their environment, we can piece together different aspects of their narrative, how they were able to survive, how they were able to provide for themselves, how they were able to trade, how they were able to develop networks. And ask, asking and answering each of these points will lead us to toward an explanation of how the enslaved population was able to move from you know, stolen captives that we see in the, in the top picture <clears throat> being marched to the west, west coast of Africa to revolutionaries, right? Who could orchestrate the largest successful revolution in, uh, of the Atlantic world. I mean, this is a, 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 I feel like this is a really amazing feat. <clears throat> Okay, so how do we start thinking about sifting uh, through those details, right? And we do that for, for me right now, it's by examining the different aspects that the landscape possessed. Um, for the purpose of this pre presentation, I think it becomes necessary to, to define what is meant by terms of space and place as it's common through a uh, common theme throughout my research and through this presentation. And following Heath's 2010 definition, space, is used in uh, reporting physical dimensions of characteristics of architecture and landscape, while place refers to the constructed meaning <clears throat> of space through individual experiences, through memories, and the spe speci specificity of the landscape. If the plantation space was the warp, the scale, the size, the design used to enforce rigid systems of economy, power, and control, then place would be the weft of human experiences and actions, the development of survivors, survivance strategies and meaning making, threads, <clears throat> the threads of daily life that are confined by the framework, but creatively woven through practice and resolve. So my research seeks to understand how Euro-American enslaved ideals presented themselves in the built environment through spatial layouts and use of space, ideals that were forced <clears throat> to, coha to cohabitate and often contradicted each other. All right, so again, the warp of the plantation, the general framework that we can that can usually be, usually be found in a plantation in the Americas deals uh, with, you know, the plantation overview. We have typical medieval frameworks. Um, it was self-sufficient. It was a self, it was geared to be a self-sufficient landscape, um, typically from the biggest landowners. Uh, it needed, needed to be economic, if economically efficient. And there was always a heavy reliance on ensla the enslaved workforce. Then we have, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and to kind of narrow it down to make a finer point, we have your American spaces. So we have the plantation main house. We have colonial gardens uh, that are attached to the main house. We have the nucleated center, uh, which is kind of like the economic center. Everybody would gravitate towards the nucle nucleated center uh, daily and then uh, panoptic features. And then on the flip side of that, we have enslaved spaces. We have the enslaved domestic spaces uh, of the enslaved quarters. We have um, side hustles, um, and that's really kind of important to, to understand. Not everything um, uh, in the enslaved quarter was um, gained by theft or anything like that. Um, and then we've got subversion and re resistance to some of those uh, Euro-American frameworks that are, have been put in place for the landscape. <clears throat> Further, what something else that goes into the warp of the plantation are ecological considerations, right? So from Higman, the four great desiderata in settling a plantation are goodness of soil, 
easiness of access, convenience of distance from shipping place, and a stream of water running through the premises. Although an estate may prove very productive without a union of, of, of all these advantages, it would be folly to set up upon a track of land that possessed neither of them. So not only does architectural style and spatial layout represent the spread of popular culture from the metropole, um, but it places the plantation landscape within a global like sociocultural and economic framework, right? We've got access to culture, architectural information and building methods. Uh, you needed a significant amount of capital to initiate any sort of venture in the Caribbean, especially when you're thinking about um, coffee and sugar plantations, because once you start these plantations, <clears throat> you don't see you don't have immediate return. There are like growing seasons, and and, and, and enough seasons to gain surplus before you ever see a profit. <clears throat> and of course, the investment of enslaved bodies were all the hallmark and privilege of a select group of people. Not everybody had access to this. Therefore, one of the best ways to understand colonial Euro-American perspectives and worldviews are through the lens of plantations and, and their spatial layouts. So we have as far as plantation layouts, we see, you know, symmetrical building techniques. There's temple-like main houses, um, geometric, <clears throat> excuse me, geometrical spatial organization, uh, motifs from antiquity, so relying heavily on Greek and Roman mythology, um, and of course, surveillance. <clears throat> and again, I can't stress this enough, economic efficiency. So we've got the nucleated center and the workforce size. So in order to kind of understand this visually, uh, I've got, a, I have a series of um, maps for you all to look at. This one, <clears throat> this map is from uh, 1798 and it's written as a guide for, to um, like a technical guide. Uh, for developing a, a coffee plantation in Jamaica. However, this is written by a gentleman who uh, resided in San Domingue and owned a profitable coffee plantation in San Domingue. <clears throat> there are, so if we're looking at the map, there are four distinct, almost equally proportioned quadrants of the Labrie coffee plantation depicted here. Uh, residential, <clears throat> areas of the plantation are lo located on one half of the map. Uh, let's see, it should be noted that this image was considered to be an ideal. Standards and represent, the standards <clears throat> represent a smaller operation common in the hills and mountains of the Plain du Nord, rather than the larger and more profitable sugar estates that were located down near the coastline. So uh, when a visitor would approach this estate via the road marked P at the very bottom of, the, of the, the map, they would travel near the first three of six enslaved barracks labeled L, hinting at the size of, and prestige of the operation as a whole just before turning into a tree-lined avenue. The trees would have been used to simultaneously emphasize the enslaved workforce space <clears throat> while providing a natural boundary or shield from certain kind of undesirable aspects of daily life on behalf of the enslaved. The, the trees would also further emphasize and focus the visitor's attention on the main house at the end of the avenue. Descri in describing an 18th century Virginian plantation, a tutor named Philip Fithian stated that the rows of pop poplars from an extremely pleasant form, an extremely pleasant avenue, and at the road, th at the road through them, the house appears most romantic at the same time that it does truly elegant. <clears throat> this area of the, this area was a common plantation feature throughout the Atlantic world and is known as the nucleated center and was geared to inspire the casual visitor while it intimidated the, the inhabitants, more importantly, the enslaved inhabitants. While there is no concrete layout for <clears throat> of the nucleated center, the area is often characterized by minimal distances between the three key regions, 
agricultural to industrial production areas. So that would be uh, areas K to G, F, E, and H on the left-hand side of the, of the map. The planter's house to the production center and surplus stores. And lastly, which I'm sorry, would be building A to <clears throat> K, H, G, F, and E. Uh, and lastly, enslaved spaces to the ag agricultural areas, L to K, G, F, E, and H. It was both economically efficient and panoptically expedient for certain or for centralized work areas to ensure that high levels of produ production were maintained in addition to surveillance and self-surveillance of the enslaved. However, for me, uh, one of the more interesting aspects of uh, Labrie's uh, plan concerns building A and its use as both a planter's residence and a storehouse. Um, Deeds, uh, James Deeds, you know, in, uh, in his seminal, you know, book, In Small Things Forgotten, examined, examined the popularity of how the Georgian order um, of architectural style um, and spatial layouts kind of emphasize the separation of domestic and industrial spheres, you know, personal space over communal space. Um, it was definitely kind of, it had become de rigueur uh, in the colonies. The placement of these two elements within the same building could indicate the surveil that surveillance or concerns surrounding monitoring of surplus crop production were the cause of this deviation. The main house <clears throat> is flanked on either side of the mill, labeled E, uh, and the kitchen, hospital and outhouse with the main house uh, act as a type of barrier between the agricultural production areas and the residential areas. It's almost uh, an, an optical gate that the enslaved would need to pass through daily on their trek from, from to and from work. And the spatial layout presented here is reminiscent of Palladian planning, which emphasize, emphasize symmetry, perspective views, and a Romanesque architecture, a planning style which was complementary to the Georgian order, emphasis on regimented and restricted use of space seen throughout the Americas. Another landscape, landscape element found under the Palladian paradigm <clears throat> and used when possible was the placement of the planter's house on an elevated ground, dictating the house, how the house was observed from below, but also how those below were surveilled. So the advantages of an elevated position, again, this was, uh, if this feature was here, if elevation was uh, there in the landscape, they would use it. If not, they'd find ways around it. <clears throat> the advantage of an elevated position and the associated sight lines allowed for surveillance in two ways, master over the en enslaved and self-surveillance, a concept that was developed by, by Foucault. <clears throat> and if the self-surveillance concept were applied to Labrie's mo model, the seemingly flat landscape, in particular the tree-lined space near the enslaved barracks, the trees would add uh, take on added meaning not only to shield, to shield the enslaved spaces from your American eyes, but to bolster the need to, of self-surveillance. You know, what could be, could and could not be seen through the line of the tree line by the owner and overseer. Uh, further, the placement of the enslaved barracks near, near the road may have been another type of surveillance, you know, a facet of surveillance where adjacent neighbors or visitors to the property could report on prohibited, uh, prohibited activities taking place um, in landscape blind spots. Other features of note um, in Labrie's uh, map here are the formal gardens located <clears throat> south of the main house with an adjacent orchard, the irrigation systems uh, for the fields, the mill house, and lastly, the bell tower. These features, their purpose and their physical manifestations emphasize your own American frameworks. Again, you know, economic efficiency, popularity of neoclassical architecture and spatial features. <clears throat> so, 
While Labrie's depiction is a model, this is a rep representation of a real plantation that was located in the mountains of Jeremy and was drawn by Mandel in 1775. Uh, so uh, before, before the uh, Haitian Revolution. Uh, similar to what was mentioned previously about ecological concerns, we see here that here what appears to be, you know, green thriving land, abundant water sources, and well-defined primary and secondary roads. Um, the, there are also well-defined spaces for cultivation of crops, separate living quarters for the main family, domestic servants and field servants, as well as various functional, you know, dec decorative gardens. Uh, and to give you more of a sense of what the landscape or the landscape has entails, the next slide I'll show um, the map legend. Go so, actually. So for this one, I want to actually go back to this one. I want you guys to get a close-up look at this. Oh, maybe not. Again, so we see multiple rivers running through this this uh, this plot of land. We have the main house down here on a particularly green patch of land. Uh, separate uh, enslaved quarters. We see well-defined roads. Again, and then a tree-lined uh, driveway up to the main house. Here we go. So this is what the the legend looks. I mean, I, I don't know if you like. It took me a while to decipher this legend. <laughs> um, so uh, not only because it's in French and my French is not that great, but because of the low quality of um, the digital copy that I was able to get from the uh, John Carter Brown Library. So again, we've got the main house, we've got family stores, we have, uh, you know, common accoutrement that is associated with coffee plantations. Uh, we have enslaved domestic quarters, we have a dovecote. Um, and I honestly have, have never understood why a dove coat was needed in these landscapes, like the keeping of birds, I don't know, unless it was for hunting, or like as a leisure activity. Um, we've got uh, enslaved quarters, most likely for um, individuals working in the fields. We have an enslaved garden. Um, let's see, pastures, standing woods, the bell tower, and then a vegetable garden that was uh, for the use of the main house. So if we look at it close up, you know, and try to think about, look for consistencies in the, in, in the, in how the landscape was developed. Again, we see similar dimensions of um, a picturesque, you know, uh, decorative garden at the back of the main house. The main house is a similar size actually to A and Labrie's. We again, tree-lined walkway um, and such. Let's see here. And again, so this is just trying to give you more like of a sense of what is present. Some of the, uh, uh, common threads that are we can see through the, the features, different features present in the landscapes, right? Uh, so we have, again, a poultry yard pigeon house. We've got a dovecote. We've got enslaved, obviously, enslaved quarters, uh, drying racks, mill houses. Um, one thing that I wasn't able to find in the Mandel um, plantation map was a kitchen or a hospital or a hospital yard that we see in Labrie. And for Labrie in 1798, this was one of the key features, one of the um, key structures that should be a part of every, of every plantation landscape. So, but again, we've got a bell tower in Labrie, we've got a bell tower in Mandel. Um, exactly. So we have a garden, vegetable garden. So there are a lot of similarities. So what this says to me is that there, this is a common theme, especially because Labory and Mandel were, or excuse me, the, uh, this plant, both of the plantations would have been con uh, contemporaries. 
Okay. So the two previous, uh, actually I need my notes for this. So we're gonna have to go back. The two previous plantations that I, I showed you were coffee plantations, which are on the whole a very a smaller uh, operation than any sort of any of the sugar plantations. And sadly, I haven't been able to find any representations of sugar plantations in Saint-Domingue. Uh, however, I was able to find this one, uh, which is uh, the property of the Chevalier de Profontaine, a sugar plantation that was located in Cayenne, South America. Uh, this is an exceptional example of both the literal and the symbolic dimensions found in the 18th century plantation complex. Uh, you know, Upton in said um, made a compelling argument uh, that asserts the formation of the plantation landscape was in response to your American colonists' need for society based on a hierarchical institutional structure. And quote, the private plantation usurped in many planters or in many respects the function of the town and the planter appropriated to himself the prerogatives and the good of the community. In effect, the plantation was a village with the planter's house as its town hall, end quote. Well, I would agree with this narrative, which is certainly ap applicable to Prefontaine's uh, plantation. The overall spatial setup and meaning of the space goes way beyond economic efficiency, prosperity, and the need for, quote unquote, a village. Um, additionally, the Prefontaine plantation is more akin to, you know, the typical medieval manor, or you could, could, could be considered a neo-monastic landscape, you know, a source for education for planter and enslaved families, uh, a space for entertainment, a form of government space uh, with ingrained sense of ritual and symbology, and an alternate metropole or administrative center for communities outside its walls. <clears throat> The landscape layout is not surprising given its affiliation to the French empire, right? Coupled with the fact that contemporary 18th century French peasantry were still technically under a feudalistic system, according to Ken Kelly. Let's see here. So, uh, there we go. So, <clears throat> The Prefontaine uh, property is meant to be approached from the main road through an ornate gate, past a park and cow pen and through the economic center of the plantation. So this particular setup seems counterintuitive to Labrie's 1789 ex or 1798 um, example, where the main road is lined by trees and enslaved houses on each side. As with Labrie and Renvoy uh, plantations, they were, there, was, there was a certain level of performance to this landscape. Landscapes were meant to impress the visitors with uh, the number of slaves he owned before they took the, in the view of his residence, unquote. Given this ex explanation, Labrie's 1798 design aligns with this concept. The deviations found at the Cayenne plantation by approaching the main house via the economic center and the enclosed gated enslaved quarter at the periphery, located at the periphery of the property uh, along the top portion of the, uh, of the map <clears throat> indicates that surveillance and suppression of rebellion were the pri priorities here rather than signaling to uh, the visitors, right? And this was something that, you know, Teresa Singleton uh, had mentioned in one of her, in one, in one of her uh, books. In addition, the central placement of the main house could be used as a method of gatekeeping between the economic sphere and a more genteel social space behind the main house and the, um, to the gardens. Although this plantation does not allow for the same Palladian Georgian setup like Lavery's 1798 example with symmetrical lines throughout the landscape, there are elements of the Georgian order present in the landscape, especially, especially surrounding the garden and the separation of spaces. The inclusion of garden in all three landscapes indica is indicative of, the, again, the spread of popular ide ideologies and their cor corresponding manifestations in the Caribbean and now South America. Um, this is evidenced by the similar dimensions of both main residence and the gardens. And during the 18th, <clears throat> excuse me, during the 18th century, 
Uh, this, this is a really great quote from Le uh, Leone. Gardens represented an application of the laws of God as understood by humans. Leone et al, 2005. Uh, the systematic organization of the landscape features ref re uh, reflects the you know, proper way to manage and manipulate the viewer's gaze. Um, you know, domesticate a quote unquote wilderness and was a type of symbolic capital to for, to and for a particular social class. So although there is historical documentation of enslaved gardeners, these areas would have been restricted to the majority of the enslaved community that resided on the plantation. I, uh, let's see here. These spaces actually, um, these gardens contributed absolutely no sort of economic value to the the um, to the running to, to the functioning of the plantation. So, and can only therefore be thought of as being created to be viewed by a wider public. So, to kind of compare this setup, this sugar plantation setup, to back to uh, the sugar plantation, the representations of sugar plantations that I do have in San Domingue. We are gonna then journey to Lemonade, Lemonade, excuse me, uh, in the Plain de Nord. Um, I wanna draw your attention to this, this map. Uh, it was uh, created in 1785 and, you know, fun fact, uh, it was in Lemonade Bay where Columbus's ship, the Santa Maria, became shipwrecked. So some of the things that I want you to take notice of are the size of the person, the, the size of land parcels, the size and location near the bay air, um, assures that these were well, that, that assures that these were all sugar plantations. Sugar plantations would necess necessitate well-defined nucleated centers a large workforce and a well-developed infrastructure to take cash crops to the port. That's it, which is exactly what we have here. The close proximity of plantation estates could prove to be dangerous to the management of enslaved, meaning that surveillance would have been tight and punishment for any sort of subversion would have been harsh. So if we take a closer look, and again, I'll go back to the to the bigger picture. There we go. Again, we see, so again, these are all sugar plantations. The smaller kind of rectangles, um, rows of rectangles, those would be the enslaved quarters. Again, hinting at the size of the workforce that was at each of these plantations. But one of the more fascinating aspects is the, close, the closeness of these plantations and the fact that this, these, close pro, this, these landscapes that are in close proximity, it would be almost impossible for um, enslaved individuals not to be able to communicate, form networks um, of some sort. So to, and again, to kind of tie this back to, you know, the Haitian revolution, the, um, I, this is the Galifet sugar plantation system. This is actually where my research is centered because this is where the, the uh, revolt started prematurely. So, and again, this is from Fick, but this is a passage that I absolutely adore. The slaves on the Galifet, Galifet estate in Petit Anse, however, had prematurely begun to revolt either on the 20th or the 21st uh, by attempting to assassinate the manager, Monsieur Masso. That it was on the smallest of the three on La, La Gosette that this incident occurred is hardly surprising. Of the three sugar plantations, <clears throat> it, it was here that the slaves' conditions were the harshest. In fact, two years earlier, in 1789, 20 of these slaves had organized a strike, quote unquote strike, or work stoppage in the form of collective marinage by remaining in the woods, 
for two months in order to have the commander removed. So this passage, I think, goes a long way to explain the alternate options, the autonomy, the um, will, not only to survive, but to kind of uh, push back against the system. But again, we see because this is uh, the Plain de Nord, because um, we have over half a million uh, enslaved individuals in this, in the whole colony actually, but the majority of them are here in the Plain de Nord. And we have two thirds of that population being directly from Africa. We've got a whole host of cultural interactions. We have a whole host of, um, of incendiary um, elements that would suggest that this was just a ticking time bomb, that the Plain de Nord and Haiti in general was a ticking time bomb with or without the French Revolution. So back to the, the, um, to the map, we have uh, in the center of the, the, the map, we have uh, the galley fet. Then down here towards the bottom of this plot, we have de la Pain. And then we have over here to the, to the right, uh, La Gosette. And what I find really fascinating about this is that the uh, settlement patterns are all very different and distinct on, and they were all sugar plantations. And I wonder what it was about La Gosette that was more harsh than Galifet and De Le Pain. Again, these are questions for, you know, the archeology span side of my research. All right. So kind of a lot of my, my topic has been geared towards, you know, the frameworks, but we've got to, we need to kind of discover the, the weft. And sadly, this is where my research still is a little on the light side because of, of COVID and political unrest. But when we think about the weft of plantation life, uh, landscape is more than a visual arrangement, right? It becomes the backdrop for human action. The relationship between people and landscape is an element in the articulation of everyday actions. This is the connection which allows the researcher to see the landscape as a text, a source of study that enhances the dialogue of people in their lives. So this argument can, is also incredibly relevant to the material culture found within these landscapes. Each, each pottery shirt, be it you know, coarse earthenware or refined earthenware, has a story. Each bone button or slave badge that is discovered has an itinerary attached to it and key players that created it, used it and finally discarded it. This is where so much of the potential to further reveal the enslaved narrative lies, you know, to, to reveal the dynamic nature. And the following slides illustrate how archeologists such as myself uh, can expand on our knowledge. Let's see here. Okay, so again, we've got differentiation of assigned uh, positions, assigned positions. So what these individuals were doing, I'm so sorry, <laughs> had a lot of uh, the assigned professions, you know, domestic workers, domestic servants and personal attendants allowed them ent entrance into certain spaces. They were able to move through certain ways, uh, uh, Euro-American spaces that, you know, skilled workers and field workers were not allowed to, but they still were, had, you know, full run of the enslaved spaces. Skilled workers, you know, healers, blacksmiths, coopers, animal husband, people who were working with animal husbandry. Uh, this is where you see the most potential for side hustles, for um, having little side businesses where they could gain money of their own, separate from, from, any, from what the planner was bringing in, right? Uh, the healers, especially in San Domingue, uh, the healers were so well known, enslaved African and African Euro kind of African uh, enslaved individuals were so well known that there was actual 
French legislation kind of ordering the colonials to, you know, go to white doctors rather than enslaved Africans and field workers and agricultural laborers and mill workers. Each have their own skill set and each had entree actually into different spheres because of their, their professions. So with, when, when we think about the enslaved domestic spaces, you know, we need to think about the type of dwelling the enslaved workers lived in, who was um, foundational in its, in its creation. Was the planter the one who designed it or was it the enslaved individuals? So we're thinking about orientation of the quarter of the village. Um, How was that? I'm sorry? Um, so uh, design elements and architectural structure, um, boundaries, were the boundaries of the planters making or the enslaved, how the space was used, you know, sub floor pits, uh, congregation areas and evidence of activities. Um, house yards where these activities would be taking place, you know, cooking pits, uh, were the house yards being swept. Again, something that was uh, was an African practice that was brought into the new world. Uh, Multi-generational inhabitants, you know, um, young children, uh, middle-aged grandparents, that kind of thing. And then garden plots. This is where um, the garden plots are just so fascinating to me because it was either, so um, provision grounds or personal garden plots were prevalent in any sort of plantation landscape. And uh, Gail and Young in 2004 found, um, started doing research on Monticello, right? And these, this, is, this is a passage from their, their essay. These records indicate no real difference in the goods that men and women carried to the mountaintop each Sunday for sale. Slaves not most commonly sold eggs. They also sold chickens, ducks, fish, messes of salad, lettuce, sprouts, cabbages, roots, and so forth. Um, enslaved men and women raised most fowl, vegetables, fruits in the house yards, kitchen gardens, and plantation provision grounds. They gleaned others from, you know, meadowlands and fence rows. For the most part, slaves exchanged goods for cash rather than credit, although in some cases, uh, Randolph failed to note her method of payment in the account book. So again, this provides an entree into a wider economic, um, economic circles and trade networks, both inside and outside the enslaved border. It, it indicates that the um, enslaved were able to navigate their environment <clears throat> like counter, to what we would typically believe. They were allowed to go to the, the main house and sell their wares. They were allowed to travel up, up, off the plantation to, to purchase things, right? Uh, we have black markets in the Caribbean. Again, um, in Monticello, the, the enslaved were able to walk off their plantation to purchase things in town. Uh, we have interplantation networks forming. Um, and it also provides really important insight into the consumption and choice of materials, right? So uh, again, I'm so I'm kind of going over my time here, but this is the last slide. I'm really hoping that my talk this evening has provided you with a way to look at a plantation scene like this and maybe consider all of the different elements, the different threads that are woven into that kind of Euro-American Euro colonial framework present on the landscape, right? So at the base of the, we see the ornate gates at the bottom of the map, just off of the main road, we see a tree-lined <clears throat> avenue that takes you up to the main house. Uh, over onto the bottom left, we see uh, uh, enslaved quarters, and their provision or their their yard spaces opposite uh, on the opposite side of what where the main house is, you know, providing some uh, distance and uh, from panoptic gazes, um, and also you know the possible food that's being grown in their yard and where they they might be able to take it to the uh, to a black market somewhere off the. The plantation. Again, we see plant, uh, enslaved individuals working in the main courtyard. There's elements of, you know, symmetric lines with two buildings flanking the main house, that kind of thing. 
But the way these people navigated, the, the way that they were able to walk through their spaces um, tells us and uh, quite a bit and provides a dynamic narrative for, for our future, for, for, the, for anybody who wants to learn about plantation landscapes. And with that, thank you. So I, I entered the wrong um, last slide. So this isn't a full um, list of my sources, but I will, I will happily provide my, my full list to anybody who would like to, to learn more.